Amen. Good morning. Would you welcome Brad? He is our representative for the Gideons. Good morning. I really appreciate what they've done. I have a little New Testament that I received when I first came to America. I went to public school and and the Gideons were there and they were handing out Bibles. How many of you have one of those? They were, it's really special and it's in a file that I have here. But uh, who are the Gideons? Maybe some of them don't know, Brad. Well, basically, Pastor, the Gideons are Christian business professional men that have but one purpose, and that's to win others to the Lord Jesus Christ. And we do that through our own personal witness and testimony by giving out God's word all over the world. And I've always wanted to ask this, and maybe you don't know, but how many Bibles do you give out a year? We give out about 49 million copies a year. Since 1908, we've given out two. Thank you. Thank you. Since 1908, we've given out 2.65 billion Bibles, and now we're giving out a million Bibles about every eight days. Can you tell me what that's like? Yes, Pastor. I've had the opportunity to go to a lot of foreign countries to give out Bibles. I was in Mozambique a few years ago. The people couldn't believe we would come so far to give them something for free. There was a lady there who received a testament from us, and she said, you know, I've heard of that book, and I thought one day I might see that book, but I never dreamed I'd own that book. And then a gentleman there who received a testament from us, he says, I'm praying for the heart of the American church. And I thought it was a very curious statement. I said, well, thank you, brother, but why are you praying for the heart of the American church? And he said, I know that's where the Bibles come from. I know if people don't give in America, we won't have Bibles. And he's exactly right. That's right. Um, Do you have a testimony, Brad, that you'd like to share with them as your last question? I I do. Uh, We receive many testimonial letters every year, Pastor, but my favorite is one we call the Tar Man. The Gideons are in the country of Brazil giving out testaments at a schoolyard. One of the older boys received a testament. He says, I want everybody to do what I'm going to do. And he took it and he threw it up on top of the school as hard as he could. Luckily, the other kids didn't do that. The Gideons finished their distribution. A couple hours later, they're packing up their boxes, getting ready to leave. They see a man climbing down from the roof covered in tar. And they said, well, what happened to you? He said, well, I was up on top of the roof, tarring the roof, and I was thinking about jumping off to commit suicide when this book hit me in the head. <laughs> and I decided to read it. I've asked the Lord Jesus Christ to be my Savior. Brad, thank you, you so much, much for yeah, being yeah. here. Since we do multiple services, I already gave him his check. We gave a check of $500, a lot of those Bibles. So we're excited about the ministry that they do. We're going to share a story from the Bible that you rarely really hear a lot about. Matter of fact, there are not a lot of verses even about this. You know, we had Easter, we had the death, the resurrection, we had Thomas the doubter, we had Emmaus Road, and and today we're going to talk about the ascension. What's really different about that, do you realize that Matthew and John, the Gospels, do not record the ascension? Only Luke and Mark have any record of the ascension. And there are a lot of things that we want to remember today. And, but I think the hardest thing in all the world, and after the service today, I had a lot of people who had said goodbye to children, to parents, to a spouse. It's hard to say goodbye. I know Mike and uh, his wife had a really tough time yesterday as they saw their little girl fly to Africa and re-engage in the ministry over there. And, and that's never easy. How many of you wept when you took your kids to college? Or they left? How many of you rejoiced? <laughs> I, I, you got to ask that question, okay? But it is a tough time. I remember I took Heidi to college in Kentucky and... And I got so emotional when I left, I'd pull over, and I was on Interstate 64, and I get lit up by a trooper behind me. And he walks up to the car, and he said, sir, are you all right? And I said, well, I just had to leave my daughter at college. I got you. <laughs> just walk back to his car, turn off the lights, and took off. But there are some goodbyes that are for a long term, or it seems long for us. And I can't imagine the apostles as they get ready for this. Uh, You know, Jesus said, hey, don't touch me. I'm not staying uh, to Mary Magdalene. And 
And the whole idea that he was only going to be here 40 days and then gone, and they'd spent three and a half years learning from him, and it was a hard separation. And uh, some emotions transpire through this that I want to point to you because I think it's a little different than sometimes we think. But let's go to Acts chapter 1, verses 1 through 3. And it says this, in my former book, Theophilus, <clears throat> Theophilus was a leader in church, and Luke is a doctor, and he's writing these letters. He's not an apostle. He said, I wrote about all that Jesus began to do and to teach until the day he was taken up to heaven. I want you to underline that, okay? There is a direct place that Jesus goes, and as he goes, we go. After giving instructions through the Holy Spirit to the apostles, he had chosen, after his suffering, he presented himself to them and gave them many convincing proofs that he was alive. His side, his nail prints, his thorn prints, head, feet. But he said he appeared to them over a period of 40 days and spoke about the kingdom of God. So what he wanted them to know was what was to come. How many of you would, if you could get a glimpse into heaven just for a few seconds, how many of you would like to look in there? It would change your whole behavior. You know what would really change you? If we opened up hell just for about a minute and let you see that. Okay, that's what I wish I could do with some of the people I know because I want them so much to follow Jesus, but I can't make anybody come to Jesus. Mark 16, 19 says he was taken into heaven. Okay, again, that reiteration, he is an apostle. Luke's gospel simply says he left them and was taken up into heaven, Luke 24, 51. And then in Acts 1, 9, he was taken up before their very eyes. And a cloud hid him from their sight. You know, our superheroes, we want them to act fast and fight fast and do all that kind of stuff. But you, you want Jesus to kind of slow it up, right? I, I don't envision Jesus just shooting up like a rocket up into the sky. I, just, I don't envision that. You know, the way I see it, and he may have, okay, boom, you're gone. But I, I see him going kind of slow, Years and years ago, almost 40 years ago, uh, I did a thing at the Kernersville Church of Christ because I like doing weird stuff. So we did the entire story of Jesus' life. And uh, I remember one scene that really stuck out to me, and that was the Lord's Supper. And Harvey Griffin, how many of you know Harvey? He uh, passed away just a little while ago, 96 years old. And Harvey was playing the apostle Nathaniel. And uh, he's there at the table, and there's real food on the table, real fruit. And uh, the dissertation's going on with Jesus about what he's going to do, the, the actual communion service. And I look up, and Harvey is peeling a banana <laughs> during this scene. And he eats it. So after that's over, we're doing four more nights, I say, Harvey, do not eat the fruit. It's the Lord's Supper. I don't care how hungry you are. I'll feed you before we go, but do not eat the bananas. But I came up with this idea, and I brought this guy in. He had a 100-foot crane. And uh, the guy who played Jesus was Randy Merritt, and he was killer. Had long brown hair. He was really slender, had a beautiful beard. And, and uh, I said, here's the deal, Randy. We're going to make you ascend into heaven. We're going to take you up 80 feet in the air. And the way we did it was he had a robe on, a white robe, and it was really cool. You have to see it to believe it. And uh, his harness was underneath that. It was a parachute harness, and I, they hooked him up in the back. And then all of a sudden, Jesus is telling his disciples basically goodbye, and he's taken up into heaven. He goes up 80 feet, spotlight drops, and they drop him in the backfield. And I was just praying that everything would go good on that because we were going to be on the news if it didn't. Okay. And Randy wasn't going to be in good shape if he dropped 80 feet. But it was one of the coolest things that we'd ever done. And, and Randy still remembers that day. Matter of fact, he talks about it uh, with me. And I just saw him a few weeks ago. But the Lord, I don't know how he went. But they were looking intently into the sky as he was going. Acts chapter 1, verse 10. Because it's hard to say goodbye. 
saying goodbye to your child when you drop them off to college like Tracy and Mike, saying goodbye to people who are in the armed forces. Um, there was a guy we met yesterday. I was at the National Drag Race, and uh, Barry introduced me to some very powerful people there. He is very well known. He is a celebrity. Oh my gosh. These guys are signing autographs. There's 100 people in the line, and they look at Barry, start smiling, and say, Barry, come on. And we just walk through all of these people, and, and they take time and go sit with us, and some of them took them into the trailer. But I remember the one guy, Tony, or Doug, excuse me, Doug, who uh, owns his own jets, a lot of them. Yep. And he owns uh, an airport. And he's got a contract with the United States government, and what he does is picks up the body of soldiers from all over the world who are killed in action or in accidents. I said, that, that's amazing. So drag racing is kind of a sideline for him, in all honesty. And he was so gracious to take us into his suite. And these trailers, I could live in one. I really could. I, it was incredible. But how great these guys were to set aside time to talk to us and, and just share with us their conviction and their love. And Barry prayed for every one of those guys and for their families. But sometimes you have to say goodbye. Sometimes racers die. It's one of the things that they don't know, okay? Car blows apart. They hit something on the track that they missed, and, and it is over in a millisecond. And then saying goodbye to people you love, a spouse, a child, a friend. It's hard. Because in your head, you know that those people that were followers of Jesus are going to heaven, and children are covered anyway. Jesus likes them a lot better than he likes us. Just saying. When the apostle said, you're not coming, he said, don't forbid those children coming to me. I see a Jesus who loved people, but he especially loved kids. And as we look at life, it's hard to let go of that. I told a, a lady out in the hall who have lost three children through tragic things. And she just hugged me up and she said, I needed to hear that this morning again. We need to be reminded that we're not going to the ground, we're going to heaven if we're followers of Christ, amen? Now I will tell you this, and I want you to hear it, and I want you to hear it clearly, please, that not everybody goes to heaven. I don't care how good you are. I don't care how much community service you do. You go to heaven because you have connected with Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. No man comes unto the Father except by Him. I want you to hear that. And I know some of you are going, well, big deal, you know. I go to hell, we're going to party down there, drink beer, have lewd sex and all those things. I want you to know that isn't going to happen. Just because ACDC sings about it doesn't mean it's true. I used to listen to that music all the time. I know those songs. Party in hell. You're going, oh my gosh, he listened to that stuff? Yeah, I was a rock and roller when I was young. But I found a relationship with Christ that was more powerful than those things. And I am aware now that there's not a party in heaven. It's eternal separation from God himself. And it is not something that you will look forward to. And it won't be what people say that it is. Matter of fact, you'll be in isolation. That's a part of hell. You'll be in total darkness. You'll be separated. But the greatest separation is to be separated from God because he's the life giver. And that's what death means, is to be separated from God. So today, I want you to hear this because these things, I really believe, are important. But the scripture tells us that there's going to be a reunion. Luke 21, 27. There, they will see the Son of Man coming in a cloud with power and great glory. There is a reckoning day and Jesus is coming back. How many of you really believe that? 
If you don't, you need to get your heart right today. I'm serious. What are you going to do if he comes at the end of this service? I can't guarantee you when he's coming. I just know that he is because he keeps all of his promises. But where will you be if he does come? What will your life look like? Will you be with him or will you stand against him? He says the road to hell is broad. Many there are who will follow that road that leads to death. I want you to hear that. The road to heaven is narrow and few there are who will follow that road to eternal life. And you know, as big as this crowd is, it's just, we're, we're not the home team anymore. We're the visiting team in America now. The church isn't as predominant as it was across the United States. And, and many people are divided on their beliefs, even believing the word of God is true. I believe that the word of God is God-breathed. I believe that it gives instruction and correction and it helps us to know where to go and where the path is. But we have to be willing to follow it, amen? amen. You see, one of the saddest things for me with the Gideons is that you can't go into a public school and distribute Bibles anymore. It absolutely breaks my heart. You can go into foreign countries and you can distribute them everywhere, but you can't do it in the U.S. They have to do it from the outside. And a kid has to want it, you can't make him take it. You know, I got one they just handed in my hand and it was mine. And you can tell by our culture that maybe we need to be handing out some Bibles rather than condoms, amen? Let's get it! I just think we've lost our way. And as the apostles looked at Jesus leaving, you think that there would be tears. But I'm going to read to you from the account, Luke 24, verse 50 through 52. He lifted his hands and blessed them. And that while blessing them, he was taken up. And his disciples worship joyfully. Doesn't sound like a sad departure, does it? But the angel kind of appeared and said, quit looking up, get going. It's time to do something. It is really time for the church to do something. I've hidden the, the word of God in my heart that I might not sin against God. How many of you remember that? It's time that we see, start teaching our children. And God has given me a really neat opportunity to witness some teenage guys here in the last few weeks and, and baptize one the other night and going to baptize one today. And maybe a lot more people. Some of you need to figure out where you're going and how you're going to get there but you can't get there without Jesus. And you really do need to read the Bible so that you know how to go. You know, I, I learned something about Ten Commandments is that uh, we don't keep them. How many of you have ever lied? Don't raise your hands. <laughs> you know what? I know every one of you have, including myself, okay? So we've broken a commandment, right? Right? How many of you have ever thought or used Jesus' name in vain in something that you've said or done? Don't raise your hand again. How many of you have ever lost? Now, these little kids, they're out of this category. You, you all are safe right now, okay? You don't even know what I'm talking about, do you? <laughs> Shaking their heads. You adults know, don't you? So, we've already broken three of the commandments, the one on adultery, Jesus says, if you've thought it, you've done it. Sorry. And everyone's lusted at different times. We've lied. We've already admitted that. Most of your hands went up before I told you, don't put your hands up. Okay? We've actually broken all the commandments. Have you ever stolen anything? I want you to think about this carefully. Did you ever take something that didn't belong to you out of your office, or off a desk, or... or at some time, so you're a thief, you're a liar, and you're an adulterer. That's what the Bible says. But you know what? Jesus cleared the slate for us. Amen? Amen? Through his grace, he forgave us of our sins. And that's what's so powerful this morning, and it's what we rejoice about. 
You see, unless you're assured of these two things that I'm going to share with you, then it's going to be sad for you. And the first one's the reunion. They will see the Son of Man coming in a cloud with power and glory. And then Acts 1.11 says, the same Jesus who has been taken into heaven will come back. The reunion is assured. If it happens, that's it. There are no second chances. You're either in or you're out. You're either on the left or you're on the right. You see, there are sheep and goats. I can tell you that sheep are a lot easier than goats. Sheep don't climb fences. Goats do. I owned a ton of them in my life. They're ornery little creatures. Maybe you're a goat today and you need to become a sheep. You need to switch your type. Because the sheep are going to be on the right and the goats are going to be on the left. And they will be separated for eternity. There's a lot more non-believers in the world right now than there are believers. And maybe that's my fault. Maybe it's our fault. But it's time that we get serious about leading people to Jesus and letting them know what God can do. And that one day we will have that great reunion. You see, the second thing is that the separation is good. John 14, 28 says, If you love me, you will be glad that I am going to the Father. Why? Because he's going to do something. Galatians 3, 13 says, The curse of the Father. And that curse was sin and death. And when Jesus was on the cross, he said, Father, why have you forsaken me? Because you see, the sin that you carry, the sins that we talked about out of the Ten Commandments, guess what? He came to blot all that out. And it only happens through the blood of Jesus, and he covers us. And he is also our representative, but the only way he could do that was take all the sins that have ever been committed, and all the sins that you'll commit, and in the future will be committed, And he put them all on his shoulders and he destroyed death at the cross. Death means to be separated from God. And that separation doesn't have to happen if you will come to Jesus. It's that simple. That's the gospel. That you believe he died. That you believe he was buried. That you believe he rose. And that you believe he's coming back. Amen? It says in Philippians 2, 9, God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name above every name. And that could only happen through his death, his resurrection. So, what are the benefits to this? How's it going to help me? First thing is he's sending his Holy Spirit to us. John 16, 7 says, It is for your good that I am going away. Unless I go away, the counselor will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. How many of you have the Holy Spirit in your life? Has he ever directed you, helped you? You know when he helps the most at the time of death? Did you realize that? There aren't a lot of things that I can say to people that will ease that pain. But the Holy Spirit... It says that he comes as a comforter. And even though you may not know that he's comforting you at that time, he actually is. Either that or you're not in a right relationship with him and it's time to think through it. It's time to get serious with Jesus. And I know this makes people mad and I'm going to make people mad and that's all right. Because you need to hear the truth about this. Not everybody's going to heaven. Not everybody I bury went to heaven. That's why I don't preach people into heaven and I don't preach people into hell. I have their kids write things, family members write things about their lost one. And I read those for them. Those are their words, not my words. I just stay away from that. If I know that that person was never saved, never gave their life to Jesus, I don't even go that direction. I talk about the hope that we can have in Jesus. I'm not the judge. So I don't get to decide who is and who isn't. Who gets in, who doesn't get in. But I know, because John said it, I write this that you might know that you have eternal life. Amen? You ought to know. You know what else is true? 
they know they're not. I've talked with thousands of people who are outside of Jesus, and they know it. Say, well, I'm bound for hell, but it's going to be a great place. We're going to party there. No, you're not. Better get that thought out of your head, because it is not going to be a pleasant journey for you. But can people change? Beth and I were talking about this this morning. She was in the Hells Angels. She's a one percenter. She now goes all across the country and rides her bike and witnesses to people, shares gospel. But her husband was hardcore, one percenter. We met in Florida. Golly, it had to have been over 30 years ago. And we became friends and we began to kind of minister to each other and and he was such a great evangelist and he went into that culture because they don't like posers and that's why I never wore you know tried to be a biker guy I'm a biker guy but I'm not a biker guy do you understand what I'm saying I didn't want to look like a hell's angel I didn't grow my hair long I didn't have a long beard I, I didn't do any of that stuff I didn't carry a big blade on my side and you know our lead guitar player is kind of the same way he's not a poser we just ride for fun. But it gave me entry because of what he did opened the door for me to work with the Hells Angels and for them to respect me and invite me on rides. Because you can't win them if you can't be among them. Amen? And I'm called to win all people, and that's how that began to work. It's how it began to change. But you can't be afraid. When God opens a door, get in there. Get in a fight. Don't stand back and go, well, I don't know that I'm qualified to do it. Yeah, you are. If he's opened the door for you, step in it. Why? Because we are going to get spiritual gifts. When Jesus left, this is what happened. When he ascended on high, he gave gifts to his people. He gave you gifts that you can use that he doesn't give to everybody. Some of you can sing. Some of you cannot and I'm not looking at anybody. I'm looking at this stage right here. Okay? Some of you can evangelize, and you're really good at it, but some of you, that's not your gift. You, you need to do it in a small setting and, uh, to get it right. And some of you have the gift of giving. I mean, you're tremendous givers, and God gave you an avenue to make money, okay, and the ability to do that. And that's a special gift. It's one of the gifts. Some of you just really love and encourage people. How many of you like that gift? Ah, oh, it's a good gift. But he gave us gifts, and if he hadn't left, we weren't going to get those gifts. But now the Holy Spirit is dwelling in you. Did you feel him in this room today? There was something special about what we were doing and, and the praise and worship and, and the heart behind that and our singers. And, and I watched Joanne, and she won't like me saying this, but I'm going to say it anyway, walking around this auditorium and praying over this auditorium before she got up here. And she did a great job on the stage. Thank you so much, Joanna. The other thing he does is he intervenes on our behalf. Listen to Romans 8, 34. Christ Jesus is the right hand of the Father. And what's he do? He intercedes for us. We're all sinners. We've all fallen. And we need somebody to intercede. And guess who's doing it? He's our attorney. Any of you ever needed an attorney? You don't have to raise your hands. It's late. Got a speeding ticket. You need an attorney. It did something. You need an attorney. What do they do? They come to defend you. They stand between you and the judge. Guess what Jesus does? He intercedes for you. He stands between you and the eternal judge. And guess what? If you've been washed in his blood, you're good to go. If not... He can't intercede for you. And you have to stand before God on your own. Because the Bible says, you know, when we come to him, that he will remove our sins as far as the east is from the west and remember them no more. But if you're not covered by the blood, all of your sins will be on display. And they will be spoken, just like when you go into a courtroom. 
They tell you all the things that you've done, and this is what you're being charged with. And this is why you're going to be punished in this way. Go to prison for life. Be in solitary confinement for life. These are harsh things. But when you have Jesus standing in front of you, you know, I know prisoners who are free that are in prison today. They're free inside because they have accepted Christ. And no matter what's going on in there, they're living out Jesus for the rest of their lives. They messed up, but they've repented. They've returned themselves before the Father. Because Christ represents us before God. He is a high priest and he's our mediator. He is your representation and you have to have him. And the last thing is that he customized heaven for you and you and you and you and you. I go to prepare a place for you that where I am, there you may be also. You know what the coolest thing about Jesus is? Is that he was a carpenter before he became preacher and savior. And you know what he did? He went to heaven and restarted again. He said, I go to prepare a place for you. I got it. It's going to be the most beautiful place and the most awesome place that you have ever been in your life. I absolutely love what Tony Evans says. And here's a quote from him. Because Jesus went somewhere, we have somewhere to go. Do you have somewhere to go? You ever see the field of dreams? And Shoeless Joe Jackson. It's about this big cornfield. They build a ball field out there, and then all of these ex-players come out. Do you notice that they don't go to heaven? They just walk out into a cornfield. Yeah. I don't want to be just walking in a cornfield out somewhere in Indiana or Iowa. I've ridden through those states, and it's a little boring. And if you're from that state, I don't, I'm not slamming you or anything. It's just flat and long. A lot of corn. But you have to make a choice when it comes to your life, and you don't know when the end is coming. That's the hardest thing. You know, some things you think, well, I can prepare for this. I can be ready for this. I can deal with this. You can't deal with separation from God. No one can. And Jesus illustrates it in the book of Luke. He talks about a rich man who's being punished because he didn't care about anybody but himself. Matthew 25 talks about the people who will be in heaven, the sheep and the goats. And he says it will be those who fed the hungry, gave drink to the thirsty, went and visited you when you were in prison and when you were sick. He said, when you've done it to the least of these, you've done it to me. There are a lot of things, you know, as I've been going through the end of this ministry and getting ready to begin another one, there are things that stick out in your mind that you just cannot get rid of. And I remember, it's been a long time ago. It's probably been over 20 years ago. And there was a couple in our church, and they had a little boy, and his body, some of his body parts were outside rather than inside. And it was a really difficult surgery, and and he went through it. And he also had heart issues and a lot of stuff going on. And uh, they got summons to move to Indianapolis for their job. And uh, they were up there. And when the boy was about four years old, and I kept contact because I knew his grandparents and knew them. And uh, he passed away. He wasn't very big. He didn't grow a whole lot, but he was a precious little boy. And they asked me to fly to Indianapolis to do the funeral. And I remember it was in the winter. And uh, I remember how cold it was there. Snow was blowing. Ground was frozen. It had to have been near zero or maybe lower. And I get off the plane and they're there to meet me. And, and they're not talking to each other, which sometimes happens, you know, when there's a death of a child. And... Uh, We go to the funeral home, and I do the service, and we get in the limousine, and in the limousine, he sits on the far side, and his wife sits next to me, and she takes my hand. And I realize at that point that they're separated. 
And uh, she tells me the story afterwards of what happened. And I don't know if you know this, but when you lose a child, it puts a lot of pressure on your marriage. You got to be strong to walk through there. But we begin to bury this kid and the wind is just bone chill and cold. there in the car and I watch him bury this little boy my head the heart can't get together I just see a little boy going into the cold earth and then the spirit of God speaks to me he really does not an audible voice but a voice to my heart and he says he's not there it all changed from that point He's not there. He's in the arms of God. And that's not always a comfort to parents, but eventually it is. Because he's not gone forever, just for a short time in a span of life. I want you to hear that because there are a number of you out there who've lost children, and you know the pain to this far better than anything I can describe to you. But I just can't get that stuff out of my head. And sometimes I just find myself thinking about those moments, all the different people, all the different things. But God carried them through. And she finally remarried and life went on. She had another child and it was great. Everything was good. Because God's God and we're not. I do have some questions for God at the end, though, when I get up there. I just want to know why that order. And I also want to know why this lousy person down here who's murdered and done all this stuff, why don't you just take him? Let's exchange him. Let's keep the good people. But God's given them time to be saved, and that may be you here today. I don't know. I don't know who I'm speaking to a lot of the times. I don't know your circumstances or where you're at. But I do know this. That God is ready to receive you today. Amen. Amen. He's ready for you to come and kneel before him and say, I want Jesus in my life more than anything in all the world. So that's my invitation to you. If you're a follower of Jesus, praise God. If you're not, this is a great opportunity for you to come forward. Don't be afraid. If you got something going on in your life and it's going to derail your life, it's going to blow it up, it's going to mess it up, then get off that rail and get to something that will take you home to Jesus. Quit going the direction you're growing. If it's going to take you to destruction, then figure out a new path. And that path is on that narrow road that leads to heaven, not the broad road that leads to hell where everybody else is going. It ought to be pretty clear to you which choice you ought to make because the masses of people are going this way and the few are going this way. And sometimes you just have to make a choice. That's my prayer for you this morning. If you need to come to the altar and pray and repent of something, get your heart right. If you're coming today to give your life to Jesus, then you come on. But today, today is the moment. Amen?
Would you stand with me as our worship team leads us?